Thank you all for sharing with us the insights, your meaningful and interesting journeys. Uh, and now let's listen to Spark sharing uh, my stories from our beloved guests. Uh, first of all, it's about marine conservation campaigns uh, and volunteer projects. Uh, yeah, also, Mr. Sensor Yesite, uh, I would like to invite you to share uh, about this one. Uh, could you please share with us a time when you, uh, either by yourself or with your team, participated in a marine conservation campaign or a marine conservation volunteer project? Sure. Uh, we Back in those times, uh, we didn't know about uh, underwater robotics or like the, uh, marine robotics at all. So we weren't able to target specific needs of the community, but we had to first improve ourselves. But as soon as we did, uh, we joined a couple of uh, events um, and by because we had a lot of um, opportunities to, to uh, test our vehicle in open sea conditions as well. Unfortunately, the Bosphorus in, in Istanbul is, is, is you know, um, that's too windy uh, for those kind of cases, and it's it's a little bit dangerous as well to be testing uh, these kind of robots in a in a student's manner. So we did we weren't able to uh, do some tests on 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 the phosphorus, but um, the 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 main uh, the main aspect that we have uh, in order to be able to build a better future is that we wanted uh, to build an exploration robot that can they can map the seafloor, they can uh, detect uh, certain uh, biological creatures under under the water. It's so it, this has been our focus and and I haven't been uh, involved in in such uh, in such events uh, deeply because I was more in the technical background and, and how we deliver what people need. And, and, and people have been working with such activities uh, based off the technology that we have developed uh, for time to time. And, and it's really, really uh, good to see what you built is being used for, uh, for valuable uh, works, I can say, or activities. Yeah, thank you so much. Like one more time, I was so happy to say, like lots of like contributions with passions right here. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so uh, for the next share, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Roger Maslin. He leads the OCT in connecting people with the ocean, promoting uh, pro-ocean behavior, and working towards a healthier ocean, particularly for uh, marginalized voices. Uh, his role involves advancing the mission sustainably on regional, national, and global scales. Uh, so Mr. Roger Maslin, uh, could you please share the obstacles or troubles that you have overcome or the most memorable moments on the marine conservation journey? Certainly. Uh, um, can you see the screen? Yes, we can see it now. Okay, so I think from our point of view, um, the key obstacle um, that we see from, let's say, this side of the world in the UK um, is really the simple issue that we've lost connection with the ocean. Um, that's the principal issue that people, unfortunately, have, um, have forgotten their link uh, with the ocean. So what we're trying to do, trying to encourage uh, and make people more ocean literate. So basically to have a better understanding uh, of what impact their lives have on the ocean and vice versa. And so again, there's this concept of a kind of marine citizenship, and that is what our uh, one of our three key programs that I explained at the beginning uh, is all about. So this is our um, ocean advocacy program, Think Ocean. So in essence, it's quite straightforward. Conservation is all about people, but what you need to do is create that emotional, uh, that emotional connection, that ocean connection. And our experience is all about trying to give people to start experiencing and participating with the ocean. That leads to discovery and learning. And basically, if you learn to love something, you're more likely to care for it and, and act 
uh, in its in its in its welfare. So our behavioral pathway is experiencing and participating, getting that emotional engagement, discovery and learning, and then connection and action. And we work both top down and bottom up. We work with governments, we work with the UN in trying to um, improve um, humanity's relationship with the ocean. And then we can use our aquarium, our National Marine Aquarium, um, where we have over 300,000 people per annum. And again, we can help influence their behaviours. But it's all about this connection, whether it's in festivals, it's on the beaches, it's using um, uh, VR headsets, or just getting people just to experience an ocean life. For us, it's all about Think Ocean. So that we'll be running some campaigns over the next um, 18 months or so, again, in the UK, just trying to encourage people to think about the ocean. And then locally, where we are in the southwest of England, in the UK, um, the, um, the, the sea area um, called Plymouth Sound has just been designated the UK's first national marine park. So basically, it's a fantastic opportunity of really trying to put the ocean at the heart of a city and try and make this part of the UK a little bit more ocean literate. So hopefully it can all lead to a healthier ocean. The issue is that we've lost connection with the ocean and we need to do make a great effort to try and re-engage people with the natural world. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for uh, your efforts. Uh, it's really great like, to let people have chance to connect with ocean and like they have a uh, real experience. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, also for this topic, uh, Mr. Sobi Abdul Razak, uh, on the journey of marine conservation, working in marine programs uh, or when working with the small scale fisheries, do you have any obstacles or troubles that you have overcome or any memorable moments? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, exactly. Uh, I'm a bit confused to how to answer it since, you know, there are different ways to answer it. From Fishy's perspective, yes, uh, I believe there are a lot of uh, obstacles. You know, uh, there is a need of improving monitoring, surveillance, and compliance. From management perspective of fisheries to local level while ensuring the livelihoods of the fishermen as well. Like, you know, these fishermen which are cutting their, uh, their fishing gears and just, you know, to release this animal, which is, they were just sensitized. What is next for them in the store for, from the government's perspective? So this is a question for everyone, you know, to sort of, to rethink really about it, especially for those who are involved in, in the coastal fisheries. In addition to that, I think, you know, from my perspective, uh, own perspective is, you know, uh, navigating the marine conservation journey. It really involved, you know, a lot of challenging, like, you know, for uh, for staying with the fisher community, for the collaboration, overcoming bureaucratic hurdles to secure funding, and, you know, to persistently, to keep, to remain persistent in, in communication with these fishermen without losing their interest and, you know, highlighting their efforts and in project advocacy as well. In short, for me, like considering my talk is that, you know, the memorable uh, moments surfaced through successful wildlife releases, the community's adaptation of sustainable promoting and helping us, you know, promoting sustainable fisheries. At the same time, you know, it is really encouraging to see that, you know, they have a good catch, which ultimately contributes to their livelihoods by the end of the day. So these milestones underscore the impact of conservation efforts and reinforcing the significance of ongoing you know, dedication of, uh, to safeguard the marine uh, ecosystems. To rightly answer your question, sorry if I talk a lot, uh, I think, yeah, here. Yeah. So this was the you know, most interesting part of my journey. Like, you know, I wasn't aware that you know, this fisherman, which is on the left, is basically one of the fisher communities. We supported them for the data collection and synthesized them for the data collection and reporting. On the back side, it's, you know, they, it, 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 they are their sons, basically. What happens, like, you know, after working with them for six months, like, you know, um, it was really interesting for me to, overwhelming for me to know that, you know, what, we, what they were doing on the back hand is actually, you can see that, you know, the, in the middle is my colleague, basically. They have invited us to their house 
So this is the house of the bridal. So bridal are sitting on the back in the picture. So with this, you know, we were unaware that, you know, the incentives that we were trying to, you know, to give them, they were trying to, you know, to save them. And it com contributed to their, you know, in their happiness. So by those, you know, limited amount of their money, they were able to, you know, to, you know, to celebrate, you know, to let their, you know, sons to get married. Uh, with this little amount of the uh, of the money that we, we used you know to give them so this was something like you know out of the context for me being there and you know they have visited us there that the the the, the, uh, the house of the brood, bride that yeah, we are sitting there uh, and the photo is taken there so ultimately in the on the other hey other way how they were you know uh, thanking us they think uh, they express their gratitude you know in the, in the left picture is basically and within their cultures and norms, like if you are, you know, handing over uh, any person or any lady with the traditional scarves, it is considered one of the precious things for them to honor you. And this is something that, you know, they're thanksgiving for us. So this was something that is really different. And I want to like, you know, we are, we are working for the communities without realizing that, you know, their emotions that, you know, we ultimately contributed in their happiness. So this is some, there was something you know, interesting for me as well, something to remember. Over. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for your share. Uh, we see that on, on the, uh, the journey with lots of challenges, but like still have lots of interesting and meaningful things uh, to discover and also like to explore. Uh, yeah, one more time. Thank you so much for your efforts and your dedication. Uh, yeah, so uh, let's move to our next share uh, about community activities and campaign uh, for raising public awareness. Uh, we have Ms. Mary Jane Lamos, uh, like, uh, who impact on a meaningful journey to establish Tagby Tagby, a circular economy initiative and efforts during women-led businesses in coastal communities uh, in the Coral Triangle region. Uh, the initiative upcycles old clothes and denim into marine theme plus toys, uh, raising awareness of life below water and empowering margin, uh, marginalized women. Uh, so, Ms. Lemos, uh, if we organize some community activities and campaigns to raise public awareness, which activity do you think we should do? Uh, thank you so much uh, for the question. So, um, there are two ways of doing so. So, one, the first one is that um, you identify community issues surrounding you you can either volunteer um, start with that because you're still exploring which one would also fit your style like um, if there's a coastal cleanup and if you're really interested of doing it like it's really easy you can just show up and you know bring bring a plastic bag or they have um, they have uh, collecting materials uh, for you already and basically, that's like a one-time activity that has been done by most of um, people. You will meet people there. And that's the easy way of doing. And the second one is basically you start your own campaign. And um, that uh, that way is that you explore yourselves. You find a team. You find people. Um, in a way, you've already pre-identified which um, project or activity you want to do. So, for example, when I started um, Tagbi Tagbi, I've already... I, the only... Um, notion that I did is that I really want to continue working in the marine environment, raising awareness, but not in research, like not in the field anymore, because it, I, am, I think that's not for me. That's a different uh, story. But basically, I've reached to the point that um, I've identified that um, my strength will be on um, basically providing opportunities for women. So what I did is I explore social enterprise. I don't have any business background, maybe like the, the business that we deal every day, like buying things, but that's out of the context. So basically you have to ask people around you, like how do, how do we even come up with a business proposal? How do we even come up with a project proposal? That's um, the first um I guess outline that you have to do when you want to raise a campaign and then with that you have to find people that can help you and once you have the people to find uh, when we have the people that can help me we have to prototype on ourselves so we have to teach ourselves learning how to sue learning how to create um, products with the themes uh, related to the ocean and then once we have that as, as our skill additional skills we um, 
reach out to communities we already uh, work with. So it's easier to um, do a campaign or a project if you already have a pre-existing relationship with um, with a community. It makes more sense to them that you're coming in with an idea. It's it's not easily accepted at all. It takes a lot of um, um, hours, a lot of talks, a lot of a lot of um, you doing the things, seeing them, letting them. Basically, we make the toys in the island, and then we have like we pay them so that they are exposed. It's more on like uh, triggering their mind that okay, we have this toy, and then we show it to the tourists. Ask the tourists like, how much are you willing to pay? And basically, once they hear like, oh, there's an opportunity on this, and that's when they start asking questions. So. From asking question, I think uh, curiosity. When once they start being curious of what you're doing, that's when I guess you kick you kick off the project. Like, okay, let's do uh, the next level of like engagement now. So it's a step by step. You start from zero, and obviously, uh, three years of working, um, like managing and doing tagbi tagbi. We are still learning. It's always, there's like, you're not growing if you're not learning. So basically that's the concept of um, um, a campaign may it be like a short-term campaign or a long-term campaign. You always learn something new and definitely it's worth trying. Like there's no harm in um, in in trying rather than regret uh, that you didn't do it. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we also noted the insights from your share. Uh, yeah, and we keep learning and keep like, developing things. And we also love um, tech free, tech free a lot. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, how about you, like uh, Mr. Sensor Yasutu? Uh, what if we organize some community activities and campaigns to raise public awareness? Which activity uh, do you think that we should do? Well, this is one of the... Uh questions that are also in the chat. Um, so I think from a, a robotics enthusiast perspective of view, um, I think that the student challenges uh, help a lot in order to raise some public awareness because um, the student teams, the young generation, the, the people, the future engineers who will be taking part in the future uh, is excited to join these, these kind of competitions because I've been there and people, people are uh, extremely uh, happy to take part in such uh, competitions, and uh, because it's it's a it's a challenge uh, that challenges their uh, their ability to develop something to to uh, bring some solutions. Because you're not constrained to a single solution, uh, you have sets of solutions, and and people can engineer their own solution and and, and be really happy uh, to to see how it is solve an actual work problem. Now the competitions that we, we are currently preparing for uh, may not be directly, you know, linked to to an underwater conservation uh, challenge, but but I think eventually will will uh, contribute to uh, to that ideology. But I think having a, a, um, a competition that is specifically targeting for such fields will be extremely. Uh, useful and, and helpful to the community because I mean I personally would like to encourage the teams that I mentor to to take part in such competitions and 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 uh, help build a better future. Yeah thanks a lot uh, for your share also noted uh, amazing insights and yeah so let's move to the next topic uh, I would like to invite Mr. Razak uh, so if you have an underwater conservation robot, how do you want it to help you in marine conservation? All right, thank you for that question. Uh, this is one of those questions which includes my interest as well, because, you know, um, I think, you know, I've been working with the different, you know, uh, projects from, you know, wildlife, marine wildlife to the mangroves with the coastal communities as well. A few, a few years back that I had, you know, submitted a proposal to uh, UN, um, UN, you know, proposals about, you know, innovation. Unfortunately, it wasn't, you know, secured the funding. So the idea was that, you know, if I, by building on that, you know, proposal, if I had the underwater robotic, definitely I will explore 
the, the uh, corals community, which is uh, haven't studied yet in detail, like we have it in two, in two spots uh, in, in Pakistan. And um, of course, yeah, so I would love to, you know, to use that, you know, for those, you know, community or for those in those areas where diving is considered as, you know, a risk or, or, or as an obstacle as well. So if I had the robotics, I would love you know, to use it with the belt up with the sensors, sensors you know, to de detect underwater chemistry to, you know, to allow me to analyze the climate change impact by, 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 by you know, altering the chemistry of the water within those ecosystems. At the same time, I would love to use, I would love to see that you know, robotic, whatever the product it is, uh, underwater or on um, a remotely monitored. It should be powered with the artificial technology, and it should allow me you know, to take the pictures as some parts by you know having GPS points, and you know to regularly keep monitoring the growth, identify the species, you know to uh, to monitor, regularly monitor their uh, health, and you know the change in it, especially for the bleaching uh, events as well. In addition to that, I believe that you know underwater uh, robotics also. Is a very style and in a way, in a way to ways, you know, to uh, to be used uh, as a tool in marine conservation. You know, it can serve uh, serve a lot of efforts. You know, like you know, renting boat, you know, cylinders for the scuba divers, all the human efforts and risk is included in it. And it should be like when it, when it is in, equipped with the sensors and capabilities. I believe that you know uh, it will help. You know. It, it would help me you know, to have comprehensive uh, surveys, you know, uh, to, you know, to um, to look at the coral reefs, monitoring their health and the status, biodiversity there. It's not only the coral reefs. There are a lot of fishes as well. At the same time, I can use that robotics, you know, to collect the, you know, images of those sharks, especially in those, you know, hot spots, to, you know, to keep taking, you know, the pictures, which have their distinct, you know, uh, pattern within their body. You know to collect and and you know contribute to the to the those you know regional databases for um, for counting the uh, populations of whale sharks as well. So, I mean that you know it depends like you know what is the motive. And for me, it is like you know I would love to use it for underwater you know exploring underwater biodiversity specifically for the for the you know um, understanding the biodiversity and environment. Um, uh, so for example, you know. Um, if the corals are at risk or not or damaged, what are those human activities? What are those conditions there? So I would love to need to explore it in that perspective. In addition to that, I believe that you know robotics could be used, you know, for collecting underwater garbages or the ghost gears at some point, with a few limitations, of course. And uh, at the same time, it can be used, you know, to for the aquaculture of the coral reefs as well, you know, while planting them within the coral ecosystem as well. So there are a wide range of those you know, different activities, but it is really a, a matter of concern that, you know, what you want, what is your interest and what is the interest of your nation or the country that you want you know, to, to use it. For me, I would love to use it, you know, for the, for, you know, uh, as a tool to be used for monitoring the declared NPA and you know to uh, to look at the conditions uh, of the underwater biodiversity, and you know keep assisting assisting those underwater biodiversity in systematic you know uh, seasonal way. So this is these are my thoughts that if if I got it by Aladdin's, you know, <laughs> sorry, definitely I will use it for these kind of activities. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Reza. Uh, well, not to, like. Hey, from the share, so, so uh, can raise for us more ideas from your own perspectives. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, and also for this one, uh, Mr. Roger Maslin, uh, if you have an underwater conservation robot, how do you want it to help you in marine conservation? Yeah, so um, as um, Sherv just said, the um, underwater robots can be used and will be used uh, for so many things going forward. From the earlier talks, you know, just imagine it could be used to minimize bycatch. But I know there are a number of projects around the world where they're putting multiple drones in um, to effectively uh, take all the all the kind of measurements of water chemistry. Anyway, from our point of view, very specifically, we use ROV 
to really help uh, monitor the impact of our Blue Meadows program. So this is three things. This is really just finding the seagrass um, and uh, also then being able to um, uh, monitor and measure the impact of our of our restoration efforts. Um, and so what we've got is, um, and I was really interested to see what Sensor was saying, but here's our little, here's our little uh, ROV. Um, it's incredibly accurate because it uses military technology. Uh, essentially what it does, it takes photographs of the seabed, stitches them together and creates a map. So we can basically use this ROV to be able to measure the impact of our restoration measures. And one of the things that we're trying to do is create a blue carbon credit um, as a way of funding restoration. Uh, one of the things you have to do is be able to prove to investors the amount of additionality that your restoration efforts are making. So how much additional seagrass is being uh, has been planted, has been grown. Um, so we basically use this technique to be, to be able to measure it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Maslin. Uh, also noted about your sharing uh, with amazing perspectives. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank all of our guests for the shares. Uh, thanks for your passions, your kindness that you are radiating to the community.